Have you ever wondered what role drugs played in World War II? Drugs played an unexpectedly significant role in the war, both on the front lines and at home. In this video, we'll take a look at the hidden truth about drugs in World War II, the ways in which they were used, the impact they had, and the moral implications of their use. Welcome to Pure History. Don't forget to subscribe and let us know in the comments what you would like to see in the next video. During World War II, why did speed, also known as amps, pep pills, uppers, and lid poppers, suddenly become so popular? During World War II, there is no doubt that the Japanese, American, and British armed forces used a lot of stimulant drugs. But the Germans started it way back in the war's early stages, long before anyone else had tried those. Even though drug usage was seen as a symptom of the moral decline of the entire community in Nazi Germany, the military leaders saw no problem with indulging in it. When speed, also known as amps, pep pills, uppers, and lid poppers, came out in the late 1930s, it was hailed as a miracle drug. This was at a time when other drugs were discouraged or outlawed. The little pill had a poetic connection with the Nazi slogan, Germany, awake, as it would energize and boost the confidence of the soldiers. That made it easier for the Nazis to feel like they were smarter and stronger than everyone else. Speed helped with hyper-alertness and attentiveness, but other drugs like alcohol or white junk were more of an escapist delight. As we've talked about in other movies, the idea of super soldiers was especially appealing to the military during World War II. The lightning oranges were hailed as a simple way to give regular soldiers superpowers. Because of Hitler's declaration, we don't need weak people, we want only the strong, drug addiction became synonymous with being powerful and becoming stronger. However, it was American Olympians in the 1936 Summer Games in Berlin who were mainly responsible for popularizing speed in Germany. Prior to the 1936 Olympics, German chemist Friedrich Hochschild discovered that American athletes were doping with Benzedrine. Later, during World War II, American soldiers, especially pilots in the Air Force, used Benzedrine to help them stay in the air longer. After finding the substance in the US, German chemist Friedrich Hauschild studied it and made amps, which are related to amphetamine and are very similar to it. Hemler Werke trademarked the term Pervitin for this intriguing chemical in the winter of 1937. Pervitin became an exit for the entire German population. Because the company advertised a lot, Pervitin became well known in just a few months. After the pills could be bought in stores without a note from the doctor, their popularity went through the roof. Boxes of chocolates spiked with speed were also sold. The drug's most vital function, however, was still to come. The blitzkrieg tactics used by the Third Reich from 1939 to 1945 shocked the rest of Europe. Since then, its military prowess has become a recurring theme in the study of the past. Most academics say that Nazi Germany's rise to power during this time was due to the country's advanced technology, efficiency, and new ways of fighting. There was no room for error in the Wehrmacht's plan. The amount of ammunition, the timing of the offensive actions, and the dosage of performance-enhancing chemicals used were all meticulously planned. The Germans used Pervitin as a wartime dietary supplement. It resulted in increased vigor and decreased appetite and sleepiness. It was said to have caused a lot of happiness and made soldiers believe that Nazi propaganda was all roses and sunshine. Prior to 1941, Pervitin was widely advertised across Germany because of its legal status. From 1938 until it was banned in 1941, it was advertised all over the city of Berlin on billboards. Blitz, Drugs in Nazi Germany by Norman Oler claims that the entire country was once addicted to speed. Though it's easy to make fun of now, Pervitin was never intended to be a Nazi military drug. Rather, it was created to compete with Coca-Cola, a popular American soft drink that was already widely consumed in Germany. Moral was the one who first gave Pervitin to Adolf Hitler. The drug was tested on students to study the change in their concentration and effort levels. Otto Ranke, who was in charge of the general and defensive physiology at Berlin's Academy of Military Medicine, quickly said that this drug could help German operations on the front. He hypothesized that speed and its components could help the troops perform better. 
and then Hitler ordered it to be used for his armies. The Impact of Pervitin on Military Strategy Otto Ranke was optimistic about the drug, but he wasn't sure if it could really help him build a super army. So he ordered it to be mixed with the field ration, where it could be eaten up to twice a day. Only after a short time on the medication, the troops' behavior changed drastically. They were reckless and too euphoric, even in the face of grave danger. Otto Ranke had the idea that chemically enhanced soldiers could be used to beat the enemy. This was now possible. The military was putting in up to 60 kilometers of walking and three days of non-stop work. This was one of the most significant things when the Germans invaded Poland in 1939, rushed through the French Andes in 1940, and fought non-stop for 11 days in the Balkan campaign of 1941. To celebrate the success of his discovery, Otto Ranke started taking the drug regularly. He imagined himself sitting next to Hitler very soon, carrying out the Nazi fantasy of global dominance. As his letters reveal, he and the rest of his office staff were likely working long hours and abusing prescription medications in order to deal with the stress of their jobs. If Hitler's secret weapon was drugs, what changed in 1941? Pervitin made a huge contribution to Hitler's Germany. There were certain to be negative reactions to the drug. Early reports reported symptoms such as fatigue, heart pain, and circulation issues. With the help of the Reich Health Führer, Leonardo Conti, the results of these studies led to the restrictions and ban of Pervitin in 1941. Warnings that the drug was no longer available without a prescription were disregarded. Even though Hitler and the Nazi party had been spreading anti-drug propaganda since 1933, the new rules were mostly disregarded. Germany as a whole had become dependent on Pervitin, and the sudden ban on it definitely led to a large number of people leaving the country. Hitler, ironically, had a serious addiction problem. Even at home, many people believed that prohibition was ineffective because it did not make Germany less powerful. The military did not care about the ban or the regulation because it was dependent on drugs. Officials in the military seemed to be okay with it getting out, especially since it would help the military right away. As soon as rationing started in June 1941, consumption went through the roof because of this disastrous Operation Barbarossa, which went on until December of that year. The law also has a dark aspect in terms of possible conspiracies. The fact that many Germans could become addicted to Pervitin may have put too much pressure on the people who make speed. So, it's likely that the fake prohibition was only put in place to make sure there were more supplies for the troops who would be fighting the Red Army at home. As early as 1941, the Reich knew that Pervitin had dangerous side effects and could lead to addiction. However, the amps kept the country going even while troops died of heart attacks or committed suicide during the psychotic times. For the blitzkrieg to work, tank inventory had to move forward all the time, no matter what time it was. Denmark and Norway both ultimately fell in 1940 due to this. In just one month, the Nazi army quickly and effectively took over Holland, Belgium, and France. When the Germans marched into France, they didn't have any reinforcements, so the French defenses fell apart under the attack. In just 11 days, German tanks covered 240 miles of rough terrain, including the forested Arndes region. British and French forces dug in because they thought it would be impossible to get through the Arndes, but they were easily avoided. It was not uncommon for paratroopers to land ahead of the main force and cause mayhem behind enemy lines. The British press claimed these troops were drugged to the max, making them fearless and crazy like Vikings. Even Churchill was surprised by the huge number of armored vehicles that came in and quickly cut off all communication and destroyed the countryside. In his autobiography, he writes that it was the biggest shock he had ever experienced. Obvious drawbacks to using Pervitin include the potential for addiction. If soldiers were given Pervitin on a daily basis, it would change their lives and their ability to function. When the Germans ran out of supplies and had to pull back, chaos broke out in their ranks. In German concentration camps, people often had nausea, hallucinations, anxiety, depression, and a general loss of mental ability. Despite Conti's best efforts, military use of Pervitin continued at high levels. As the crisis got worse, there was a steady rise in the number of service members who died from heart attacks, accidents, and military mistakes. It wasn't the army that was in charge of Pervitin, rather, Pervitin was in charge of the army. 
During interrogations, Morrow found out that Hitler's addiction to Pervertin caused him to make bad strategic decisions that led to the enemy's victory at Normandy and, in the end, the fall of Berlin. Even though it worked at first, the Wehrmacht's miracle drug helped bring down the Third Reich in the end. The only company to benefit from the drug's constant production was Temmler Wernke, which made enormous profits. This was today's video, but we have more interesting videos for you.